Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Martin, and thank you to all of you in the uh, Yorkshire branch for inviting me to talk to you this evening. Um, I note my very last email in my inbox this evening was from Julie Williams, our CEO, inviting us to donate, but it feels a bit like last gasp for the 80% decline that there is in our, in our species. But what I want to do this evening is to kind of give you some hope is that the work that I've been doing while I've been at BC for five years is to go out and promote uh, better management of amenity grasslands in particular, better creation and management for all sorts of wildlife. And it starts with the basic flora, the wildflowers that we all want to see. And um, that's based on my uh, experience while I was working, I think, for about 25 years at Dorset County Council as their county ecologist, um, where I got involved in a whole range of um, uh, restoration schemes on quarries and landfill sites and development sites. Um, and I also got involved in the um, quite a large scale road scheme, at least for Dorset, uh, which involved um, creation of a very big road verges, which I had a free hand to create as wildflower verges. And this slide here shows one of those. Every spring, absolutely plastered with cowslips. But I was also in, put in charge for the last four years of my tenure at Dorset Council. I was at, uh, in charge of all of their green space management. And what that did was for the first time ever, as far as I'm aware, in local government is to put an ecologist in charge of um, amenity grass management and when you put an ecologist in charge things can happen finally is that you can start looking at amenity grassland as an ecosystem rather than just as a well bit of green stuff that needs mowing frequently never really understanding why it needs mowing and how to try and reduce that and how to encourage more wildlife within and so the story I want to tell you this evening is, is about my experience of habitat creation and habitat management in an urban context. Um, and of course, the lessons you'll learn from that spill over into the rural as well. There's, this, is, this is the same grassland ecosystem nationwide and of course the same grassland ecosystem across the whole of Northwestern Europe. So <clears throat> let's get going. Here's some typical urban grassland. Um, for perfectly good reasons, we quite like to have our lawns if we're fortunate enough to have a lawn as being a nice mown piece of flat grass, nice and green, hardly any weeds in it, because it's quite nice to lie out on, it's quite nice to look at. As a species, we quite like the neat and tidy, but it is, of course, almost devoid of wildlife. And on the right hand side, this is more the typical local authority side of mowing grass is that, well, we used to mow grass a lot. And now with uh, less money to spend on that sort of service, we mow it less often. And so when we do mow it, we tend to leave a hell of a mess. And so you end up with these brown patches of rotting grass that just sit there. So even our amenity grasslands, <clears throat> public open spaces, tend to be looking rather tatty and with that uh, strewn grass on there there's hardly any wildflowers that can possibly thrive in that sort of environment. So our amenity grasslands are already very poor and they don't have to be that way and we've actually got to do something about it. So and here's why. So we know that they're really poor for wildflowers and really poor for pollinators. You don't go out to an amenity grassland to count butterflies by and large. So we're not making the best use of what we've got. But actually, if you tot it up, and I've left the reference there at the bottom on number one, is actually we've already got in urban green space, we've already got 41% of all urban land is green space. And of that, 4% road verges, 7% parks and open spaces, nigh on 30% residential gardens. So we've got all this space and we're not using it properly for wildflowers and for insects, butterflies, whatever. 
And if we do, not only will it offer those public health benefits, the other ecosystem service benefits of pollination, but it might actually bring quite a bit more joy into our lives. There will be nothing better, I think, than being able to walk down the street of a morning to see bees and butterflies on your way to collect the milk or the newspaper. So what's going wrong? Well, our current system of management is we're locked into, well, in the business, we call it regular cyclical maintenance, mowing every few weeks, basically. Um, on our road verges, if you go out in the, in the rural areas, they might be cut once, twice, three times a year. And in urban spaces, over the last five years, I've established that uh, local government is up for mowing grass between five and 22 times a year. So some of the inner London boroughs are still mowing grass 22 times a year. No wonder wildlife doesn't get much of a chance to thrive in that. And so the question I've asked myself for my project, building sites for butterflies, is are there smarter solutions to cutting grass that can deliver more wildlife? Can we do that at a cheaper price? Can it be more carbon friendly? And indeed, can it still look tidy at the end of it? Because that's important. People need, I think, to see a bit of neatness and tidiness in lives. And I don't have a problem with that. It's just, can, do we have to do absolutely everywhere all the time as neat and tidy? And when we do so, actually wildflowers, wildlife is really popular. And are there opportunities for engaging local communities in improving things? And of course there are. So what really matters and how you need to think as an ecologist is that every piece of amenity grass is a grassland ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, there are some fundamentals that make the grass grow. Well, sunlight, so light, water, warmth, and really importantly, soil fertility. If we can control soil fertility, no matter how much rain there is or how light it is or how warm it is, if the soil fertility is low, the grass won't grow as much. So these two pictures show <laughs> the same road verge, just 100 metres apart, same, same time of year, so it's taken in April, 100 metres apart. On the left-hand side, my engineering colleagues put 150 mil of topsoil onto the subsoil, which is the standard prescription for every amenity grassland nationwide, and then sowed it with a, a perennial ryegrass mix, and then handed it on to the maintenance crew to go and look after. On the right hand side, they had run out of topsoil. So they just spread out what they got, sowed it with the same amenity grass and left it. And look at the difference in the grass growth. So if we make our soils fertile or we use fertile soil to, to, in our amenity grasslands, all we will ever grow is grass and you know, some, some thuggish weeds. On the right hand side, you'll see that you're still performing the same green function but it doesn't need cutting. But instantly you can see there, daisies, dandelions, there are salandines in there. There's a whole range of very common wildflowers in there. And that's the ecosystem that we want to work with, is that as soil fertility decreases, the biodiversity of our grasslands increases. And we know that's true because our most diverse grasslands in this country and across the whole of Northern Europe are based on those with the least fertile soils. So, um, and that's because the plants that we cherish as our native perennial wildflowers are those that are adapted to cope with these harsh conditions, these stressful conditions. And they're adapted to living in soils with low nitrogen. So hence we are really keen on a lot of legumes because they fix their own nitrogen. So here are plants that are naturally adapted to coping with very harsh conditions. And if we want to create those uh, in our urban areas, then we need to increase that environmental stress. So we must only use low nitrogen soils in creating grasslands. And when we um, want to manage our existing grasslands to increase more wildflowers, we need to reduce the nitrogen load on the soil, not increase it. So, and we'll come to see how that is. So there should also be some financial consequences of this because 
in reality, none of us should be spending any more than we absolutely have to on cutting grass um, because it's a costly business. I estimated roughly that we probably spend about half a billion pounds a year on cutting grass in local government alone. So when grass grows on low nitrogen soils, it doesn't grow as tall. So if we can control the amount of grass that grows in the first place, we've got less to cut. And if we've got less to cut, the mowing should cost us less. That's less fuel, which means less carbon, and we can spend more time on other jobs. So potentially lower cost maintenance and higher biodiversity on amenity grasslands should align. But does it work in practice? And that's what I was able to put into practice when I took over the management of the green space services at Dorset County Council, having learnt um, from one particular scheme how best to be able to create these low fertility grasslands. And that particular scheme, I mean, I've been doing this, I, I think my first um, scheme that I created using very low fertility soils was back in 1995. But at scale, over hectares of ground, um, the best opportunity I had was on the Weymouth Relief Road um, down in Dorset, just prior to the London Olympics, uh, where Weymouth held on to the sailing events. And this road was constructed between 2009 and 2011. I was on the engineering project team as their ecologist, and I'd influenced from a long way back during the design and then in the implementation to the, the design and, and management of these verges to make sure that nobody put anything on those slopes other than the bare minimum of soil, which I allowed to be 15 mil in places and none at all in others. And then sowed that with a suitable common wildflower mix. Um, and that suitable mix was chosen quite carefully to include species of wildflower that thrive in these really low fertility conditions and will flower, will germinate and establish and flower very quickly. And in particular, kidney vetch and uh, oxide daisy and common bird's foot trefoil. Those are my three go-to species for early establishment on the barest of ground. Uh, kind of works though, doesn't it? I mean, here is two, two and a half years after sowing the seed, here is an absolute blaze of kidney vetch on, um, this is, this ground had no topsoil at all. This is, um, this is a clay soil. So this is a sort of a very wet, claggy clay, except on the left-hand side where the more observant will see some limestone or chalk. Um, and you end up with dominant with um, kidney vetch early on because it's an early successional plant. It likes to get going really early. And having got it going on this really early, it's sort of really bare soils, this plant will then thrive probably for decades. Um, the reason that we like it, of course, is because of the small blue, which has its, its only food plant is kidney vetch. Nationally, it's one of those species that's, well, by and large, in decline. Certainly from the central parts of England, it's um, it's not doing well. It tends to be a bit more coastal. You'll have to post on the chat where it is in Yorkshire at the moment. Um, uh, but once you get up into Scotland, it's it's coastal up to Ayrshire, and then um, coastal up to Sutherland on the east coast. But it's basically gone from much of central England, except where there are conservation efforts. And I think in Dorset, it was always very common on the coast. And um, I'd like to think I've had a hand in that in Portland through restoration of quarries. But inland, it's on the very best nature reserves, not on amenity grasslands. But now on the Weymouth Relief Road, we have clearly the largest population of small blue anywhere around in southwestern Britain based on these seven hectares of wildflower grasslands, <clears throat> which early on were utterly dominated with kidney vetch, but now kidney vetch is just a very important part of the uh, wildflower sward. So that's back in 2013. Um, 
shortly after you get a, a lot of wildflower establishment you know, we are very lucky down on the chalk in dorset and the limestone because we can grow horseshoe vetch and really nice to report that um, both adonis blue and chalk hill blue have moved on to the road verges adonis blue didn't have to travel very far to be honest it was uh, perhaps a mile and it arrived within oh, a couple of years so uh, probably a year after um after the small blue so it, it disperses quite well. Chalk Hill Blue, on the other hand, um, Chalk Hill Blue in the country is doing quite well, particularly in the southeast, but in the west, in Dorset, its populations are collapsing for reasons unknown, except on Portland. And Portland is the lump of rock you can see in the far distance. And we reckon the Chalk Hill Blue has dispersed from Portland to get to to get to the Weymouth Relief Road. And that's about 11 miles and completely inhospitable habitat between Portland and the Relief Road. And yet it's managed it. How well is it going to do? Well, we'll have to see. If it follows the course of inland populations in Dorset, it won't do very well at all, but it's there. Um, it arrived in 2019. Um, it's had a bit of a faltering start, but in 2022, the numbers were really pretty good for an establishing uh, colonizing species and fingers crossed for this coming year so really nice to see but it's not just about the butterflies i know we're keen it's also about the wildflowers and on these barest of soils we get this huge population of orchids appearing now in most years it's pyramidal orchids and in amongst them are large numbers of bee orchids. I defy any county council mower to go there and destroy the colonies. We are talking vast, vast numbers of orchids. And overall, we've got about 141 species of plants at the last count that were there. It's probably now we're on 2023. It's probably gone up to probably 150 or so different species of plant established on these verges. And that's on seven hectares of ground and 30 species of butterfly. That's kind of half the British list that have been recorded by the good, the good and gallant volunteers from BC, including myself out there doing a transit walk. And um, really nice to see. And it's not just the common and widespread species. To have species like wall and chalk hill blue and honest blue, small blue on there does show that some of these amenity grasslands carefully designed and in the right place can look to support um, you know, not not just the common species, but also a whole range of more interesting ones too. So year on year, these road verges look spectacular. And this was in 2021, hundreds of thousands of pyramidal orchids. And for those more observant, look between the pyramidal orchids and you'll see a plethora of kidney vetch. So we're now 10 years on from when kidney vetch first flowered and it's still abundant in this ward. So it's self-generating in profusion. And guess what? Small blue are still super abundant on that site. So it's a, it's a real prescription for how to be able to create high wildlife value uh, um, amenity grasslands really, really quickly. If you use no topsoil on bare mineral, that's what you can produce. And last year, 2022, this was a drought year. And the, so the grasses in, in by uh, mid-June already burnt off, but the wildflowers going, what drought? And that's because our native perennial wildflowers are those that are adapted to cope with stressful conditions. I mean, look at the ladies' bed straw that's coming up there. Fantastic in amongst all these orchids. So it's a real prescription for a sustained wildlife resource having this low fertility soil as your starting block. <clears throat> now, what's really important is that those verges have had no maintenance since they were created. And that led me to think, you know, I, we didn't know that at first, did we? But 10 years on, nobody's needed to go out there with a mower. And what I've been looking around the country is, where else do we find that? And one of the sites that I've um, noted around the country, and it's one that I've been passing by since the M27, which runs from um, the New Forest through to, to Portsmouth along the south coast around Southampton. There was a, um, uh, the motorway was put 
along the chalk ridge between Fareham and Portsmouth. And that verge had no topsoil on it, because I remember seeing that it had no topsoil and it. it was just a subsoil over chalk. And over the next decade or so was a profusion wall to wall wildflowers, so a, a succession of oxide daisies and kidney vetch and then um, um, field scabious, absolutely wonderful. 40 years on, that road verge has still had no maintenance. And I would say, if you or I were managing that as a nature reserve, I think we'd say, mm, a little bit too much scrub, we need to get there and remove some of it. But 40 years on, no management at all, no grazing, nothing happening it's still performing a wonderful ecological function. And that was quite by accident. So this prescription of no topsoil or very, very little topsoil followed by a bit of wildflower seeding or natural regeneration is a real winner from, um, from a nature conservation point of view and should really be giving us great heart that we have in our toolbox, the ability to produce grasslands um, high biodiversity value grasslands really quite quickly within um, within a, a you know a matter of a few years they're starting to perform well and with very very low maintenance costs. And one of the organisations I've been working with very regularly is National Highways. They were the Highways England, but now they call themselves National Highways. And uh, fairly early on in my um, uh, existence at Butterfly Conservation, I was given four minutes in front of the chief engineer uh, for England, and I showed him four slides, including a couple of the ones that you've seen today. And at the end of the four minutes, four slides, he said, why wouldn't we want to do that? As a result, National Highways have a major project instruction, which is on all of their open grasslands on their new major schemes, there will be no topsoil. So we should expect to see on any new road schemes, the big road schemes, this low nutrient grassland instruction being rolled out now. And if so, then I think that gives us, you know, should give us some heart that other people, it's not just me banging on about it, is that actually big organizations and their engineering consultancies understand the need for this. And the first scheme that imp has implemented this low low nutrient grasslands instruction is, is on the A2 between the uh, M25 and Dover at a new junction leading into Ebbsfleet Garden City. Um, and just recently, just this year, um, uh, I've been involved with National Highways and Bath Spa University, along with Natural England and Plant Life in, in writing the um, uh, a chapter on um, highway infrastructure, particularly the blue-green infrastructure, so that's basically the grasslands and the ditches um, uh, for the Institute of Civil Engineers Manual of Blue-Green Infrastructure. And that is effectively the engineer's bible to be able to um, give them examples and case studies of how to create these high biodiversity grasslands on their infrastructure. So just moving on a little bit, I mentioned a couple of times about uh, carbon footprint. Now, clearly, if we're going to spend less money cutting grass, then we're going to spend less fuel, and that means less carbon required to cut that grass. And I worked with um, uh, Dr. Sarah Wynn from ADAS to try and put some facts and figures around that for the Weymouth Relief Road. And if you look at this bar chart on the right, um, my low topsoil prescription meant that no topsoil had to be spread over these verges or a very minimal amount. And there's hardly any maintenance required. And so you end up with a very low amount of carbon that has been and will ever be used in maintaining those grasslands. Now compare that with the standard prescription. So if you look at uh, the dark blue bars, that, that's the standard amount of topsoil, 150 mil of topsoil that would have normally been spread on those verges. And that's the amount of carbon that would have been involved in getting that topsoil into its final position. And then the pale blue bars are the amount of carbon that would be used according to the amount of mowing that would normally be required every year. So if we look at the left-hand bar, that's 
mowing the grass twice a year, which would be a normal rural cycle for, for um, mowing grass on, on rural roads, and a minimal maintenance requirement, which might be cutting the grass every four years to keep the scrub down. <coughs> So, and that you can see the difference in the amount of carbon that we use. So if we compare the left hand tall bar with the right hand really low bar, that's a 97% reduction in the amount of carbon that would be used in construction and maintenance. So this is a complete no brainer. It's, we, we, are, we have a prescription here that will absolutely guarantee high biodiversity and absolutely guarantee reducing the amount of carbon we have to uh, used to maintain it. So that's construction. And I hear you say, fortunately, we don't spend our time constructing roads very often. Can we increase the wildlife value of our existing amenity grasslands? Now, here's a picture that I'm sure will be familiar to many of you. It's local government out there having mown the grass and leaving the arisings on top of the grass that's just been mown. Tell me what happens as an ecologist to that grass. Well, it rots. And when it rots, the nutrients are returned to the soil. And when the nutrients are returned to the soil, that feeds the roots, which then grow more grass the following year. But that system, which is a, an ever never ending cycle, is actually worse than that. Because do remember that rainfall carries nutrients. So there's nitrogen dissolved in rain. And you can see the cars here. Aerial emissions also carry nutrients and those are spread out over the grasslands. So very, very slowly through rainfall and aerial deposition, most soils, unless they are really free draining, become more fertile given time and, and the standard management, not less fertile. So add to that, the, 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 uh, the mildness of our autumns and springs, by and large, perhaps not today, but normally. And we end up with grass growing long, uh, you know, for a longer season than it ever has. And uh, in London now, the road verges are being mown every month of the year. And I notice now, even in Weymouth, we're, we're seeing um, uh, uh, amenity grass in particularly new housing estates being mown 12 months of the year. So grass is growing sufficiently to require maintenance all the time. So just at a time when we want to fight against this, we've created a system that is that, that, that won't work. So we have to get on top of soil fertility in grassland. Otherwise, we will end up having to mow more and more grass forever. <clears throat> it's not just the mowing of grass because remember, this is an ecosystem we're dealing with. Um, and so the pressure comes, well, why don't we just stop mowing, Phil? What happens if we just stop mowing? Well, on the left-hand side is what happens if you just stop mowing. This is a picture from a London park, Burgess Park in London, where that has happened, largely as a trial to see what happens. And you end up with grass and, and some wildflowers about one to two meters high, and presented to the crews that then have to go and look after it and maintain it, they haven't got the kit anymore to do it because that's too thick. The thatch is too long. The mowers won't cope. So simply encouraging local government to stop mowing is not the answer. Also not the answer is planting mixes of annuals. It's not good enough to plant mixes of annuals. They look very good. So here's what the Olympic Park looked like back in 2012. We love these because they bring a bit of brightness to our lives. Have you got any idea just how good they are for wildlife, in fact, for particularly for butterflies? They're pretty rubbish. Take common poppy, for example, which we think of as a native species of plant in this country. Well, the first thing is it isn't native. It was introduced from Southern Europe a very long time ago. And the second is there are no species of butterfly or moth that have anything to do with poppy. Come, you know, on the other side, look at common bird's foot trefoil, one of our native perennials. There are 45 species of butterfly and moth associated with that. Come on, folks, we just need to be out there planting native perennial wildflowers wherever we can. There's, a, there's space for annuals because they look beautiful, 
and they're part of that transition and I'll come back to that in a bit but but in our heart of hearts we know what we should be doing we should be out there promoting native perennial wildflowers because they are best for our wild life and in particular for our butterflies and moths we can change the basic management system of our amenity grasslands our existing amenity grasslands to reduce the fertility currently most of the grassland across this country is cut and left so it's it's cut it's chopped it's left the grass falls it rots and it returns the nutrients to the to the soil what happens if we go in there and take that grass away during the growing season and that's not just doing what you and i might do on our lawn which is every saturday morning we might cut an inch off i'm talking about going in there and stripping the nutrients out that is allowing the grass to go really long and then harvesting it that nutrient cannot go back into the soil and there are some interesting consequences when i was put in charge of the mowing teams we used to send out a team of three people each time we were out mowing somebody to do the cutting somebody to strim around the street furniture and as a banksman and somebody on the on the leaf blower to blow the cut grass off the pavements and out of the drainage gullies back onto the verge where it would rot down if you cut and collect the grass you only need a two-man team so there are instantly savings to be made there that i couldn't have even contemplated at the time so here's the process and by the way this doesn't have to be on chalk and limestone and sandy soils you're looking here at clay soils this is oxford clay there is nothing brilliant about this clay at all it's claggy mucky stuff if you go in and and rather than doing your five or six cuts a year of the of uh, you know to keep the amenity grass neat and tidy go in there and do three cut and collects in a year so let the grass get really long as long as possible perhaps end of april early may again in july and again in september so only when the grass gets long go and harvest it and then see what happens and here's the picture of that the following year this is a photo taken in mid-may after the three cut and collects the previous year and look at it in mid-may this grass does not need cutting at all so by taking three harvests effectively of that grassland we have not drained all the nutrients at all but we have certainly stifled the thuggish grasses all those tall grasses and big herbs that would kind of you know, smother the wildflowers have gone or well, they're very very much you know you can see a dock in the foreground that's struggling that's mid-may and look at the common wildflowers that are coming in their place they were always always there but now they've got a chance to thrive and if we went back to that um that same verge, this one in Little Moore Road in Weymouth, we'd now see 20 species of wildflower in that, um, in that grassland. None of them have been sown, they've just all moved in there. And that includes bee orchids and pyramidal orchids that have just moved into the clay soil. And it's just a delight to see. This system is a system that works for wildlife. So after four years, so here's, um, here's this is again in my hometown in Weymouth, um, this is uh, just up from uh, Sainsbury's and it's it's nowhere's well it's just a piece of ordinary road verge that used to be cut five times or yeah five times a year perhaps now it's on twice yearly cut and collect and you can barely see a blade of grass in there it's all wildflowers so some grasslands convert very very quickly indeed there's another one um, where you now just by doing a, a, this is twice yearly cut and collect now look at the abundance of, uh, of um, oxide daisies and there's a yellow rattle and ox um, and common birds foot trefoil coming up all over the place and this is just by reducing the fertility of the soil these wildflowers which are now pretty abundant throughout weymouth uh, are, are getting going so the system is cheap to maintain and floristically wonderful same happens on roundabouts um roundabouts are often oh crikey i mean you'll all all know about roundabouts that have got um uh, uh, you know cottage garden plants that are put in there planting schemes every year 
well, not not when not when I was put in charge. We had all the roundabouts stripped of all the rubbishy vegetation and put in with low fertility soils. Uh, wherever there was um, uh, street furniture, so the advertising hoardings, the chevrons, the signs, those got graveled around them, dug out the topsoil, put gravel in there so there's no weeds, and then the rest of it put down to native perennial wildflowers. It's fantastic every year, and of course the wildflowers are now flowering from April to August most years, and uh, either one cut, uh, cut and collect a year or, or possibly two. That's all that's required to look after them, and they look fantastic. In Dorset, we're also finally, finally getting to some of the big machinery because um, some of some of this. Uh, we'll come to what to do with the arisings in a minute, but. Um, um, the, the, one of the big challenges is what to do on some of the high speed roads where you've got uh, regular cutting that has to be done at night. It's very costly because you have to shut the road and it's very difficult to do this work on, on what they call sort of mobile um, traffic control. Um, but one of our contractors in Dorset has invested in what's known as this sidearm flail cut and collect. And uh, it's very expensive machinery and you do end up with a lot of grass. But the system says that if you can uh, cut and collect uh, uh, all, you know, as much as you can of, of that grass on there, it will, it will repay back after a few years because you're having to cut it less frequently. And if we look at, um, this is the A30, this is between uh, Sherborne and, and Yeovil in Dorset on, on the dual carriageway. And you can see on the left, um, you know, a horrible looking for the central reservation where you can barely see the Armco barriers. And even after just one year of cut and collect, which is done twice, you can see just how much the uh, grass has been nobbled and, and uh, it's, it's, just not look, it's just not thriving as much. And so now the system will be to uh, uh, do that as a cut and collect twice a year. And the hope I would say the expectation within a probably another couple of seasons is that what was once a two times a year cut and drop will go down to a once a year cut and collect to maintain the visibility and the sight lines on this dual carriageway. So you should in the end, after probably three, four, perhaps five years, be able to reduce your cutting by about half on that road verge. And that has the potential to be rolled out nationally. But there are some buts, of course, um, and we'll come to those in a minute. Well, how good is all this for wildlife? Well, it depends. I think there are some areas where it's going to be very beneficial and other areas where it's probably a bit slower. But just remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to encourage wildflowers. And our earliest trial in Dorset was back in 2014 on the uh, bypass outside Blandford town. Um, and after five years of cut and collect, the Dorset Wildlife Trust reassessed that verge and said that it was so full of wildflowers in the summer that it then would qualify as a county wildlife site. So in some sites, it's only a matter of a few years before the site becomes of significant value for wildlife. Remember this verge, when I took it on, was being cut three times a year on a cut and drop system and it's now on one cut and collect a year and its wildlife value has increased immeasurably. So yet again another massive no-brainer for this system works, you just have to persist with it. Well it is really important to bring the community along with you. None of this can be done without community support and in local government terms that also means political support because this is public money being spent in the public interest and our political masters say what can and can't be spent. So when I changed the system in Dorset from a cut and drop to cut and collect, I had a parallel program working with the community to inform them why we were making the change. And um, we had a hashtag love your verge as our, as our kind of um, a social media um, hashtag. And it seems to have, you know, I can't say that we've stopped all the complaints coming in. In fact, I suspect there are probably a smaller number of complaints than there were, but there's still a significant number of complaints coming in that the verges are scruffy and they don't like the wildflowers and it's all horrible and it's 
detracting from the area. But what there are now a significant number of people who say that they really like the wildflowers, they understand why the council's doing it, it's saving money, it's saving carbon, and it's adding more wildlife. Why wouldn't we want to do that? And that uh, system is, is something that's now continuing so that every year there is a new Verge campaign in Dorset to let people know what's going on. It's also important in terms of community engagement to identify where the sites are. So um, here were some regularly gang mown areas of grassland at the edge of an urban development um, uh, you know, with, with footpaths and cycleways linking to the highway. And where the wildflowers are is kept as wildflower grasslands, but the, but the one meter strip next to the tarmac for the footways and the cycleways are, are mown more regularly. And that's in order to frame the wildflower areas so that people understand <clears throat> that there is something different about the way those areas are being maintained. And uh, once people understand that, then I think um, then I think that's it's certainly helping in terms of a balance of people who don't like this against the people who do. It's also nobody's stopping you walking in there. So we're very happy for people to go and walk in those wildflowers just to go and see the butterflies. And they're all there, all the common species that you'd expect to see are all in these grasslands now. And remember, these were gang mown, boring rye grasslands um, just, just a few years ago. Now, <clears throat> I've mentioned the annual wildflower mixes, these, these, these uh, cornfield annuals, they are spectacular. Um, I have on occasion worked with communities who've been really insistent that they want cornfield annuals. I've let them know what I personally think about cornfield annuals and their contribution to uh, supporting wildlife. Um, and I've said, look, you're very welcome to have them, but at the same time as sowing these uh, cornfield annuals, please, please include the native perennial wildflowers because we will end up with a system that's sustainable. If you think about what a cornfield annual is, is that the soil needs to be disturbed every year in order to maintain those annuals every year because they don't thrive in, in um, a, a, a sward of grassland. So that in itself encourages more weeds to come in, in particular fat hen from agricultural fields. And so many of the uh, annual mixes tend to get invaded by fat hen, which I have to say, it's a nice plant for a few moth species, but it's not very attractive and you soon lose out the color. But if you add the perennial wildflowers in there and then manage them on cut and collect, the end result is within a few years, you have something that I think is equally spectacular and it's full of wildflowers that um, I think just bring a joy. And these wildflowers are of course going to sustain themselves for a very long time. Um, they don't need any plowing, they just need one cut and collect a year to maintain a reasonable level of tidiness um, and they're out there flowering and flourishing every year. <clears throat> right, the big problem with all of this cut and remove, cut and collect, cut and lift, whatever you call it, is what do you do with the arisings? What do you do with all the material that you collect? When I started in Dorset, we said, to the to the teams that were on the cutters find somewhere on the verges where you can dispose of this material as close to where you have cut it safely and legally legally if you cut grass on a road verge you can dispose of it on a road verge it is not a waste product if you cut it on a parkland and dispose of it on a road verge, then you may need a license to dispose of it because you're taking it from one land class to another. But on the same land class, you can do that legally. So what I instructed my teams to do was to cut the grass so that we take away the nutrients where we don't want them and we put them into 
new shrub areas, new tree planting areas, existing tree planting areas, where we're very happy for those nutrients to be taken up by the plants and converted in the end to above ground carbon. So it's about shifting the nutrients around. It's working as an ecologist to understand that system to, to generate what we need where we want it. And so that system still continues to the, this day, but it has been adapted as time's gone on. And the adaptation is, is um, well, in, in Lincolnshire, they've gone the whole hog where they are hmm, partway down the line of being able to get road verger risings into uh, biogas generation. Now, that's not happening in Dorset, but what is now happening in Dorset is because the savings in the amount of money that was used to be cutting grass are so high, the teams can now afford to pay for that grass to be disposed of in the amenity grass green waste composting operations that you and I might do out of our gardens. They, we can afford to use that money to pay for that. And of course, that's a very good story in that the road verge risings are going into a waste stream that's producing a useful product. So um, it's affordable, it works. And in the end, as the soil fertility reduces, the amount of grass that ever has to be disposed of will gradually decrease. And just on those savings, um, just to show you, uh, we would been able to, with my old team back in 2017, with the, the new teams now in 2021, if we look at an, uh, at an urban mowing cycle in North Dorset, the teams used to mow those verges five or six times a year. And they started in mid-March and they went to mid-October. And we had three-man team going out there and they would spend a lot of their lives in the summer between March and October mowing grass. These days, they only have to cut the urban verges on a cut and collect twice a year, including the amount of time that it takes to dispose of that grass. They don't have to mow for anywhere near as long, sometime in May through to mid-October. There's only a two-man team. And the amount of time that they are uh, taking up doing that work is a fraction of what it was. And so on staff resources alone, that's nearly 70% saving on staff resources. And they haven't yet calculated the benefits on the fuel and other savings. So this is real time data for, for staff who've been involved for years and years and years mowing grass. And now the whole of the mowing teams are utterly committed to this because they can go away and spend time mending the rights of way or leading guided walks or doing other, I think what they would say as more useful tasks in countryside management than mowing grass on verges. And from my point of view, I was the budget manager. When I took over the service, I had just under a million pounds to mow the grass verges in Dorset. That's in the urban and rural areas. And by the time I left to come to Butterfly Conservation in 2017-18, that budget had reduced to 680,000 to do exactly the same job. I didn't need the difference. I didn't need any more money to do it. And as of 2021-22, that same budget by my successor had, had reduced to 500,000 pounds. So you can see that perhaps over a 10 year period, you'd be able to reduce uh, the verge management budgets by about half from what they currently were on a, on a cut and drop system to a cut and collect system. So this is absolutely surefire way for local government and anybody else who cuts grass uh, moving to a system that will save them money and deliver a load of wildlife. <clears throat> so here's my conclusions. We have to think of amenity grassland and that will include our lawns uh, as, as much as anywhere else, we have to think of them as an, as an ecosystem. And when we do that, we can think of ways to change the old day job, which was just to cut and leave the arisings. And, and we can do this not just on road verges, but in Dorset, the road verges are managed in the same way as the parks and open spaces. It's the same teams who do the same management on verges as they do in, in the parks. So they're all, everything is now on a cut and collect. And of course, it's saving them time, it's saving them money, and it's adding in wildflowers. 
And the key for that is low fertility. We need to get into the, into the mental space where we understand that low fertility is key to increasing biodiversity. And, and when we've got the opportunity to do so, we should think about low fertility use in design, but we can also reduce the fertility of the soils through routine maintenance. And if we do so, it will be cheaper to look after. It will contribute to carbon reduction through less fuel. And it's probable that there will be an increase in carbon sequestration as a result of the increasing floral diversity, but that's yet to be proven. And as we all know, wildflowers, butterflies and other pollinators bring joy to our everyday lives. And why wouldn't we want to do that? Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Fascinating talk. If only all of our local councils were uh, as enlightened as you managed to uh, make uh, Dorset. Um, it looks like a few others are picking up the mantle as well. Well, yes, I, I would say actually that North Yorkshire Council, is it a county council or is it a, are they still separate? Yeah, there's North lots Yorkshire. of separate ones. There's lots of that. Yeah. Um, have been in touch recently um, oh, right. uh, uh, because they'd, um, I think they felt that they were they were up for change. Uh, sometimes these changes are very slow to happen. I think when I say sometimes, almost always these changes are very slow to happen, frustratingly slow. But the case from my point of view is made, you know, the whole of this authority down in Dorset, uh, wherever the count, well, what was the county council now and unitary authority, Dorset Council, wherever it mows amenity grassland, Ex in ex with a few exceptions, it's now on a cut and collect. The rural verges are on a are on a cut and drop mostly because they're relatively narrow verges and there's not much to be gained. But any of those big open spaces in the urban areas all on cut and collect, and all of the urban verges are on a cut and collect. And it's a massive transformation. They, they just they don't have they don't have cut and drop mowers anymore. Every time a mower needs replacing, it's replaced with a cut and collect mower. So they've done it. They've shown the way. And yeah, we've got to get others to do it, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. So you presume, Phil, you're OK to take a few questions. If people have got I questions, do. please can they use the chat button and we'll run through them. And uh, Phil, do you want to? Yeah, 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 fine. OK, so we'll, well, we'll start. We'll start with um, Douglas Goddard at the top. Doug, yeah. Yeah, Doug. Um, so what would you suggest as an alternative to kidney vetch in an area where small blues are absent? Uh, well, I'd always have a plug for why are small blues absent? We need to encourage them in there. Um, but I would I would say that you want to be getting in. I, I mean, I would use you know, the species which which hosts the most um, butterflies and moths in, which is common birds for trefoil. It has to be. It's the most malleable of plants that I know in terms of you can't mow it to death. You know, you can imagine you, you, you see where common bird's foot trefoil grows. It's on sand dunes. It's on uh, abandoned quarries. It's on cliff tops. It's it's in um, it's in quite long neutral grasslands. This plant is a is a survivor and and therefore it's a it really copes well with low fertility conditions. Um, anywhere and in terms of just supporting a really good range of, of um, particularly moths but you know nothing wrong with common blue folks um, you know it's uh, we need you know I think if we saw every if every if every time somebody sowed ryegrass they included 50 50 ryegrass and common birds foot trefoil we we would we would think the place was turning into a wildflower uh, you know bonanza everywhere because the the verges the amenity grasslands would all look yellow we should that so that's my go-to i would say okay. next question hugh's asking are there any wildflowers actually suited towards a thicker layer of topsoil ah yeah well okay so two things to say here one is thick soil and the second is thicker topsoil so let's just deal with thick soil so if we went to the north Pennines A O N B area, for instance, and you had, is it wood cranes bill? Yeah, it's one of the rare plants in your part of the world, I think. Maybe, maybe uh, there probably is in your, it probably is in Yorkshire, isn't it? Wood cranes bill. It requires 
low fertility soils, but those soils need to be deep, almost probably quite peaty. Um, so it tends to survive on road verges where it's been ousted from improved soils elsewhere in agricultural land. But that requires deep soils. It cannot cope with the, the skeletal prescriptions that I offer down here in southern England. You know, you need to have deep infertile soil to get species like that going. And you could probably say the same to some extent about um, uh, that and um, devil's bit scabious, which if you're going to get that in profusion, slightly deeper soil is probably a good thing, um, but it needs to be infertile. If we go to fertile soils, what have we got in our in our in our locker? Well, I would do things like um, nothing wrong, frankly, with may not look very attractive, but common mugwort, hempagrimony. Um, I would I would still use uh, oxide daisy. I would go for tansy, um, uh, and all of these species. They may not support particular butterfly species, but they are very rich in moth fauna. And, and, um, and some of those species in your part of the world are particularly rare. We would never see them down here, but they're, they're a species more of more northern climes. So there will at some point, oh, I don't know when, but I have now got a list. I think I'll just send it to you, Martin. Um, yeah, so yeah. you're welcome to it. But I do have a list because I was working with the uh, Connect Plus services who are the managing agents for the M25. And you're thinking, crikey, Phil, you do work with some pretty... <laughs> They've got 1,100 hectares of green space around the M25, all of which has the capability of supporting more wildlife. And not only that, they're also very keen to do so. So I've worked with them to have a low fertility prescription whenever they take a digger onto one of their green spaces. And I've also worked working with them to come up with a high fertility prescription for, it'll include um, mullein, you know, great mullein, for instance, um, in a range of native species that have got, um, that have got some value for, for wildlife. And if in the end, coxfoot grass and, and false oak grass take over, well, so be it. But I reckon Tansy will give, give that lot a, a, a run for its money. So yeah, I have got a list. I'm very happy to share that with you. Okay. Uh, right, next. So there's a comment from Andrews, this question. A few years ago, I did butterfly count on some of my derelict ground fa favorite football team ground. Yay, Barnsley, excellent. Surprisingly fruitful. I wonder if it's possible to get private businesses and sports club, et cetera, to plant wildflowers. Yes, it is. Um, was it Jim Steele in Derbyshire was working with Toyota? Because they kind of, I think that's probably Jim knocking on the door very frequently, but, but that's, but there he's managed to get um, a good traction with you know, business. Have I got good traction with business? Some and some is what I would say. I haven't, I haven't really kind of managed that inroad into, um, if you like, the big building industry. So the Barrett homes and the rest of it. While this is blindingly obviously appropriate for them, as it is for any organization that mows grass, I haven't really got very far. Where I have made some progress is actually in kind of a public sector area you wouldn't necessarily expect, and that's um, NHS trusts. Is that actually, if you think about the way the NHS works itself, is that hospital trusts own lots of land, and they also have budgets which they'd rather spend on looking after us than they would their grounds. And so when I've talked to them, they're very, very interested in this. And my first success was at the um, Mount Vernon Cancer Centre in Hillingdon in, in uh, West London. And um, then that has now transferred to Harefield Hospital, which is only a few miles down the road. And that's part of one of the great big NHS trusts in Northern London. And they are now looking at the feasibility of changing their grass mowing across all of their estate, not everywhere on their estate, but they recognize not just the cost savings, but also being able to use their grounds in a different way. And that's what the Mount Vernon Cancer Center do is that um, 
both patients and staff appreciate what was previously two uh, moribund football football pitches to be honest and and one of them is still regularly mown and neat and tidy and that's fine but the other one is now converted to wildflowers with paths cut through it and it just brings joy to people's lives to be able to go out there and look at the wildflowers and the common butterflies flying around and we've also got the branch involved in helping them to plant disease resistant elms for for, for um, white down hair streak so the whole thing is just moving in that right direction but but would I say I haven't really hit it with business I haven't really found a business that's that, that I would say is um so all to play for I mean if you've got suggestions I could um mm -hmm. I could have a go put it that way so the next one's from Terry Crawford. Um, yep. It's a question really about the sourcing of things like bird's foot trefoil. He's seen a yeah. lot of uh, road verges questioning whether it really is native bird's foot trefoil. Are there problems with seed sources that you see in this country? Uh, yes, there are problems with seed sources. And I would say tread carefully, um, is that it's always best to go for, I mean, if you're going to buy wildflower seed, native wildflower seed, then go to, Go to those that genuinely, I mean, get, get advice from the local wildlife trust, get advice from whoever that you trust to, to know whether this is. Um, Emma's Gate, for instance, I mean, they're, they're very reasonable seed houses and have been going for decades and decades and decades. They will give you the provenance of, of, of all of their seeds. Um, so I work with Emma's Gate, King Seeds. Um, I work down here with uh, um, one called Heritage Seeds. And it won't surprise you to know that all of these lot, it's not a cartel, but you know, if, they, if they've got a client in Southwest England, Emma's Gate won't send their mowers over from, from Eastern England over to Southwest England. They'll, they'll get somebody over here to go and do the cutting for them. So you can, you can ask for locally sourced wildflower seed, and it shouldn't re realistically be any more expensive than wildflower seed already is. It is relatively expensive. But, you know, put into the right conditions is extremely long lasting. So I would say it was value for money. So what would I do about how local is local wildflower seed? Um, uh, I don't think it's necessary to restrict it to within your county. Mind you, Yorkshire is a very big place. So, uh, you know, you, you might like to think if you under if, if you know the botanists around you are able to advise you on you know if there are particular races of, of species that that you need to be careful of fine but over most of let's let's take the chalk in this area because i know it well the chalk runs from dorset to cambridgeshire and if we think back 200 300 years it would have all been wildflower rich grassland across the whole suite of it so there's no reason to think that the genetic variation would have been particularly extreme between the extremes of those areas. So in most of lowland Britain, I think we're okay to be putting that seed out. But I would never take kidney vetch from Dorset and put it into Scotland. And the reason for that is as the as your your uh, your latitude changes, so does your phenology. And the plant is very likely to flower at a different time. And it may well be that small blue, for instance, is that, um, you know, is timing its emergence for the timing of the flowering of kidney vetch in the different parts. And also kidney vetch, if you went down to the west, uh, to the lizard on Cornwall, the kidney vetch isn't, isn't yellow. Half of it's, half of it's bright red. It's a it's a race of it. And, and clearly you wouldn't want to be mixing that up or, or using it or spreading it. So so there are some caveats, but by and large, get advice from the main seed houses because they absolutely want to be uh, using local wildflower seed wherever they can. But don't just Google it <laughs> because you'll get fobbed off by all sorts. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer the next one. It's just Sophie asking, uh, finding yep. your talk very informative. And of course, Sophie, we have a um, on our Yorkshire branch website, um, we will always post the video link. We have a YouTube channel, so you'll be able to see it. It should be up there in a couple of days. So please, anybody, feel free to share a link to that recording once uh, we've posted it. So no problem yeah. with that. So, And, and this is, um, I mean, this system works on lawns. You know, it is that 
I, I would just urge you, if you want to do it on your own lawn or you want to encourage somebody to do it on their lawn, they do need to get behind the change. You know, you do need to understand that you're trying to reduce soil fertility. This is not just about leaving it to grow longer. So no mow may is fine. But but it you know it's not quite getting on top of the ecology of the system that ecosystem. It's no mo May May to August and strip the nutrients out in those other months. You know it's 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 both and and uh, so you know I do mo no mo May, but that's because I also do no mo May to August and then I'm out there mowing hard in September and then and then you're know, getting the nutrients down as much as possible. So that follows quite nicely, Phil, into the next okay. question from Peter. Oh, what would yes. you recommend for domestic gardens? Grow long and cut in frequently? Yes, it's, yes. Now, I think there's a chap called Martin Callagher in Sussex, who I think probably has got the garden to envy. He says most years he's got 23 species of butterfly in his garden. And that is just by, just by, it's working hard to make sure you've got all the food plants there. So understand, know the food plants of the butterflies. And remember that quite a lot of butterflies are going to require grasses and that very few of them eat false oak grass. So don't use that one. Um, so most, you know, gr uh, allowing grasses to grow long is as important as, as reducing the nutrients. And that sounds a bit like an oxymoron, but you do need to allow, for instance, if you want to have small skipper, Essex skippers with you? Mm -hmm. Yes. So small and Essex skippers, you realize that they lay their eggs in the in the dying sheaths of, of, of the um, of the grasses and they will hibernate either as a very young larva or as an or as an egg. And so if you clear away all of that vegetation, you will clear away all of the eggs or the tiny larvae of those skippers. So it's important to be able to do things on a cycle if you can in a, in a garden. So don't cut everything every year. So leave some bit short. A, a, rot a, you know, a rotation of half and half or a third, a third, a third is, is, is good. But if your garden is really rich to begin with, then don't try and do that leap all at once is go there and reduce the nutrients and then tinker with the management to benefit the butterflies. So if you want, you know, you may struggle for natural uh, regeneration and dispersal to get the food plants in. So I would go and buy some plug plants of butterfly food plants and get them into the lawn or <clears throat> try and get them into the borders as well. So, so you know, just, just use the space that you've got to encourage that diversity of native wildflowers. So, and what is wrong with having a great clump of devil's bit scabious in your garden? I mean, it's fabulous stuff. Well, I've got loads of scabiouses and all sorts in, in the garden down here. Um, you know, it's not every year, you know, they, they, they seem to do pretty well, even on, I mean, I've got some horrible clay soil and it's slightly fertilized by the dogs, but you know, you just have to work against that, don't you? And, and so I'm constantly going in there and doing a little bit of scything and raking up and then adding another plug plant in there. Um, you know, the gardens are, well, it depends what you want to do with your garden. It, it, it's hard to maintain all gardens neat and tidy and put the butterflies in there is that that something will have to give. Um, but uh, anyway, I hope that helps a bit. So the other part of Pete's question was yeah. how important is uh, yellow rattle in reducing the strength of grass? Yeah, very good point. I haven't really talked about yellow rattle. Um, uh, I would say yellow rattle used to be known as the meadow maker. And um, although I would have thought it was a bit of a pain for farmers to be honest because it had it parasitizes grass but it will also parasitize about 20 to 30 other species of of herbs of wildflowers but it preferentially goes for grasses you cannot use in my experience you cannot use the seed of um uh, yellow rattle to get rid of tough thick thuggish grasses. So you already need to be heading down the line of lowering the soil fertility before you add the yellow rattle in. And the reason for that is twofold. 
firstly, it's quite a diminutive plant. It's not a big plant. So if you're trying to get it to, to suck the living daylights out of a, a, a big coarse coxfoot grass, it's not gonna happen. The coxfoot will win out every time. If on the other hand, you've already started to reduce the fertility, then it will start to work. But remember that yellow rattle is an, is an annual and it needs to germinate on, on damp, bare soil in amongst the, the, the grassland. So it just needs to have a little bit of bare soil to germinate and it needs to be sown before the winter. So it needs a decent frost to, 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 um, to vernalize the, uh, to the seed. Um, so you need to, to have quite, a, quite an open sward. It doesn't necessarily need to be a short sward, but it needs to be an open sward to get the yellow rattle going. But when it does get going, it's really good. So, so it's, a, it's both and, not either or. So you can't just use it to, 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 to get rid of the grass because grasses on fertile soils will always win out. Question here from Doug uh, Goddard. There's a yeah. trend towards creating butterfly banks from soil removed from elsewhere. How do you, how do you maintain low fertility on these and create wildflower slash butterfly? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think I'm a, I'm a fan of butterfly banks um, and, and don't think the butterfly banks have to be banks. So we had a project in uh, London boroughs of Croydon and Bromley called uh, Brilliant Butterflies, uh, where we created 45 banks in inverted commas, some of which were chalk, raw chalk that was imported to soil, on, onto a site, a school site. And what we, what we always did was to go there with a small digger and scrape away the topsoil, mound that one, we didn't, mounded that up and then blinded that topsoil off with a thick layer of chalk and then spread chalk out into the hollow where we'd um, dug out this, the, the, the topsoil. Now that's fine in an area where, you, where you've got chalk, that's fine. What do you do where you don't, which is like most of the country? And uh, clearly you've got limestone, but it depends how friable the limestone is as to whether it's, it, it works in that way. Subsoil is a very good substitute. And that can be clay subsoil as much as it, it's, it's chalk or limestone or sand. So you need, if you can take away the topsoil, bring up the subsoil, and bury the topsoil beneath the subsoil as through what's called a soil inversion, then that's a way to create um, either a flat area or a bank to your to your choosing. And, and from certainly in southern England, it doesn't seem to make a difference. If if having a south facing bank is really important in your area because it's otherwise very exposed, then maybe you do need to have more bank than than less bank. The problem we've got with banks themselves is that we've made those banks usually out of uh, topsoil at the base of the bank and then a layer of subsoil or chalk or whatever it is on top. And some plants are very, very good at getting through the inert material to find the subsoil, the topsoil beneath. And so what tends to happen is you end up with some wildflowers growing exceptionally tall. So they end up very big. And what's the long term of that? Well, I suspect long term it's going to end up as quite a grassy bank. Now, that might be absolutely fine for marbled white and gatekeepers and ringlets. And, and maybe that's no problem at all, especially as you've got your flat area where you've dug this soil out as being very infertile. So you might end up with, um, with a, a good mix of long grass and high wildflower areas right next to each other. But I couldn't tell you that was absolutely going to be the case now. Um, it's just, I, I just looked at some of these banks and I'm a bit concerned about how, how very um, lush some of the wildflowers are looking when I, when I was hoping they probably wouldn't be. So it, it's, um, but, but some of these banks look fantastic. And some of the best banks that we created in Croydon were where, where the contractor, we had a brilliant contractor who went into an area right next to a cricket pitch and just outside the boundary line and had dug up the subsoil, um, exposed it and buried the topsoil beneath, 
and made it absolutely flat with the ground around. And that area is now full of wildflowers in amongst all the rest of the ordinary mown grassland. And it's, it's looking wonderful and it's full of common butterflies and people love it. So that's not a bank, it's a flat area full of wildflowers. And it seems to me that in, in that location was, was very appropriate and, and has worked well. Question from Julianne Hargreaves. What impact does traffic have on insects? Yep. Or oh, inverts, I guess. Yep. So. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, uh, it's, what, it's what we kind of colloquially know as bug splatter. <laughs> I think is that's probably I imagine imagine where that's this this is going. Um, I, I think there are some sensible things you can do if, for instance, your road verge is one meter wide on a very fast road. Then I would suggest that's probably not the place to put the wildflowers, because almost anything that's encouraged into nectar on there will be splatted by fast moving vehicles. On the other hand, doing that in a in a town where vehicles are moving 20, 30 mile an hour, what's the problem? That's, that's just not an issue. The wider the verge you try and achieve this on, the better. The more natural the ecosystem looks, and the more natural it can perform. So hence my wanting to work with national highways is because they've got very big roundabouts, big visibility displays, huge verges. Um, which which can all perform like grass and nature reserves. There's no reason why they, they don't. It's only that they've got the soil prescription wrong. So in our in our it, we've got to you know we've got to pick and choose our areas. In urban areas, I think anything's game. In in areas where you've got a de-restricted speed, uh, so up you know 70 mile an hour or 50 mile an hour, whatever. Those are really quite fast speeds for for don't just do it on a narrow corridor, make sure you're choosing a big area. That will be my, uh, otherwise, bug splatter's real. Bugs, you know, whether it's significant for the populations, I think debate is, is out there, but it just seems a bit pointless, you know, generating this wonderful wildflower spectacle and getting lots of wildflowers in there and, and, and wildlife and butterflies, and then, I don't know, half of them get splattered. I, I'm not into that. So, but but I am definitely into using a lot of the space we've got carefully. So, uh, another question from Julianne: mm. uh, Diverging views on the allotment. How do I deliver uh, a convincing argument to reducing fertility in the new orchard away from grass towards native wildflowers? How do I practically do it? And I'll be asked, how long will it take? I'm thinking uh, making these plugs. Okay, there's um interestingly the. There's, a, there's a, a new development that the RSPB have been working on outside Sandy, outside their headquarters. And there it's, it's an orchard. Um, and they'd seen, a, the chap who was in doing that had seen a talk by me and he'd specified you know, clay rather than a no topsoil uh, in amongst the trees. Is that by and large, if you think about, if we think about post-glacial, nobody put any topsoil around. Nobody went there and spread topsoil. It's just what happened happened. And topsoil is a new invention in our lives in the last 50, 60, 70 years. It was never there before and, and it now is. So we've, we've got to get ourselves out that mindset. So the first thing to, to say is that if we want an orchard and we want wildflowers in that orchard, we need to have a low fertility soil around the trees but if you want the orchard trees, I mean, they will sort themselves out in the end. But if you want them to get going quickly, then they need to, those trees need to be pit planted and pit planted with some reasonable growing medium. That could be topsoil or it could be some compost or whatever. But just locally to help those trees get established. But you do not need to have topsoil all over the place in order to get an orchard going. When you do have low fertility soils, you will end up with wonderful wildflowers in amongst your orchard. And I have to say, what is that is wonderful. So, I mean, that would be fantastic. Yeah, practically, is it how long will it take? Well, the lower the fertility, the quicker it is. I mean, I would say two summers and, you, and then that second summer, you will have lots of wildflowers if you've started with a, with a, a pretty infertile soil. And even if that soil isn't that infertile, if 
it's cut and raked, then you will be doing that reduction of fertility that's needed. And I would certainly say, even when you've got your wildflowers in there, still do that cut and rake for the first couple of years. Even if you're thinking, oh, well, what happens to the poor skippers that are on here? Now, it's important to keep that fertility down more than it is to worry about the skippers in the first two years or the or whatever it is, you know, um, speckled woods or something that might be feeding late in the late in the autumn. Um, so and I think I would do you've asked plug plants. and the rest. I think I would plug plant as well as seed. I think uh, some of you may have experience on plug planting and mine is very mixed i've i've spent oh quite a few years growing really nice plants for neutral meadows like dyer's greenweed which is a flipping rarity and there's a whole load of moths on it and it's wonderful and i've spent three years growing decent sized plants none of which have ever, ever, ever survived. And I just think they get nobbled by rabbits or something. I thought Dyer's Greenweed was inedible. <laughs> Cattle hate it. But no, they just disappear. Somehow they don't survive. And yet, if you sow the seed of a lot of these native wildflowers, they just seem to come on. And whether that's just the whether they just establish very small and spend the first couple of years thinking about growing. But I found plug plants by and large, a bit more disappointing than I would expect. They're fine in a garden, and I think they're fine in probably a sort of parkland, but I don't know. I, I think unless you're able to tend them, something will come along and nobble them, and it's often bunnies. But I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to be proven wrong, but it's just one of those things where I'm going, well, I think I'd do both. Is that lovely to have people getting engaged with growing plants and planting them out? But you try and go back and find the one that you planted. <laughs> I bet it'll have been eaten. <laughs> one, one last question, I think, yeah, yeah. Here, Phil. Um, you've obviously engaged with a number of organisations. Question here is, have you engaged or have the Wildlife Trust engaged with you across the country or any of the regions? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I've had perhaps less than I would have imagined. But very often there's there's somebody, if I'm giving a, a talk to a broad audience, there'll be somebody from a wildlife trust there. Where I have had real success is with the Scottish Wildlife Trust, right. um, is that they've been brilliant. And, and uh, next week I'm up in Scotland running a, a one day conference, at which one of my key speakers is from the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And she's been out on the, um, it's Lynn Bates from the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And they've had a neck to network um, on the, uh, on the west coast around in Ayrshire, so north of Ayr, between Ayr and Irvine, uh, where there are, well, there is just about a colony of small blue there. I'm not quite sure whether it was an introduced one or not, but it's kind of hanging on in there. And Lynn has been out there doing some, well, I mean, I've talked to you about, you know, some relatively small mowers going in there and changing changing the face of grasslands. She's gone in there with very, very big machinery on some of these coastal grasslands and had a huge impact, far, far, far bigger than I would ever dared have tried. So she's impressive. And she said she got a lot of her ideas from watching one of my talks. And, and so, you know, I, who knows what effects I have had, but it, it's not overt and obvious everywhere. But um, every now and again, something good has come of it. So, uh, so good. Very good. I think you've answered the last question that's up here about have you tried engaging with the NHS? You've obviously had. Yes, some I have. Yes, some there. some some success in Wales at quite a strategic level. Um, I was asked to address a, a conference of NHS providers uh, where they were looking at estate management and and uh, health and well-being, and individually, uh, particularly in the in West London. Um, I would say that's probably where I've had yeah, some success there. Okay. Okay. Well, there's lots of uh, comments coming in saying thank you very much for your talk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, well, hang on, I'll just see whether there's one more. Great pleasure. Oh, plugs, uh, plugs lacking in the microorganisms. Ah, oh, uh, Julie. Yes, you're right. You might be right. Is that you know some? I mean, particularly if you think about orchids, none of us get any real success about mm -hmm. planting orchids, do we? Oh, just chuck the orchid seed out there. It just works. You know, it may take years and it, those orchids will never come up where you wanted them to come up. They'll always come up somewhere different. That shows you what 
you know, it, you just need to get plenty of wildflower seed out there and let them sort out where they want to survive. That's my, I'll oh, let nature take its course thing. Um, but, but, you know, we don't all have the luxury of scale of sight in order to operate over, but there we go. Um, well, thank you.